welcome. Hi, I'm David Cowan, President of the Museum of American Finance. This is Lunch and Learn. Please join us on March 7th when we'll continue the series with Eric Singer about the congressional effect. This is where we take a look at stock market returns when Congress is in session versus when it is not in session. Turning our attention to today's speaker, Joe Carlin. He is the co-founder of Know Thy Market LLC, which is a strategic consulting firm. He co-founded it with Robert Bell, Robert Bell of Banana Boat fame. He started that company. And together uh, with Joe, they wrote a book uh, from Lifeguard to Sun King about that uh, experience. And Joe now has turned his attention, he's written for 12 years to Ben Graham, and the book is The Einstein of Money, The Life and Timeless Financial Wisdom of Benjamin Graham. This is a very readable book. I've read it, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Joe intersperses biography with the timeless value investing framework uh, that was fathered by Ben Graham. So the chapters are interspersed, but there is also a lot about the disciples of Ben Graham and value investing, and of course, the most famous, the Sage of Omaha, Warren Buffett. Now this book will be on sale afterwards in the back. Alan will be happy to sell you a copy. and Joe will be happy to autograph it uh, for you. Now we are a finance museum, which means we've got a lot of interesting things down in our archives. And in particular, we have something called the Graham Newman Collection. Jerry Newman was Ben Graham's business partner for several decades. And so we have a lot of their artifacts and you can go on our website under the resources and collection area, uh, www.moaf.org, and see a lot of those images from that collection. But in particular, we brought up one fascinating item, which you can take a look afterwards when you buy your book. We brought up a first edition of one of the most famous books of Ben Graham that he wrote with David Dodd called Security Analysis, still in use today. But in particular, this is the first copy of the first edition, and I will read you the inscription from Ben Graham to his business partner, which we'll see on the back afterwards. This first copy goes to Jerry with real appreciation of the indulgence he showed his partner while this child was getting born. Signed, Ben, July 23rd, 1934. And so we bring you from that first copy, that first edition, to what we hope will be many editions of the Einstein of Money. It's my pleasure to introduce Joe Carlin. Thanks a lot, David, and uh, thanks to the museum and uh, Kristen, everyone who helped uh, organize this. So this talk is uh, Benjamin Graham in 2013, and it is not, uh, this talk was prepared espe especially for this event. It's not, uh, most of it is not taken from the book, but I will address the book at the end, its structure and so forth, and then hopefully we'll have some time for a few questions. So it was almost 100 years ago in 1914 when a 20-year-old Ben Graham began working on Wall Street. Within only three years, his views on the market were being circulated in the financial press of the pre-World War I era. And there he is uh, right around that time in 1916. So he was an active investment manager throughout the 20s and uh, of course the, the worst years, early years of the Depression. And by 1932, he also had six years of, of teaching experience, teaching his security analysis course at uh, Columbia and his uh, course uh, assistant there was uh, David Dodd. So by 1932, when he began writing that book with David Dodd, his, his views had crystallized into a comprehensive system of common stock and bond selection. And uh, they decided to codify that system into a 616-page volume that was drawn mainly from the course material. The 1934 publication of security analysis uh, that was just touched upon proved it was truly a landmark event in the evolution of the security analysis or what is now known as the financial analysis profession. The Graham and, in that book, Graham and Dodd wrote that a fundamental principle of investing is to discover and acquire undervalued individual securities as a result of comprehensive and expert statistical investigations. So at its essence, the value investing school states that an investment professional's independent analysis of a company's capital position and earnings performance determines the intrinsic value of a security. Just to illustrate, 
here's a graph. You'll see that line, the value line, and you'll see the price line. And Graham observed, as reflected in this graph, that the price, the market price, and the intrinsic value often defer. So when the intrinsic value, which is arrived at by one's own independent analysis, when that's sufficiently uh, higher than the current market price, one purchases the security with what's known as a margin of safety. And that's one of the, that's sort of the linchpin of value investing. So Graham and Dahl observed how this principle of margin of safety uh, was ignored during the euphoria of the previous decade of the 20s. Uh, the investing public during that time would buy absurdly priced securities that were promoted aggressively. So these intrinsic value and margin of safety were neglected as a phenomenon called Mr. Market took the reins. So Mr. Market is sort of a, a parable, a characterization that Graham ascribed to the market, a bipolar individual who would get overly despondent with bad news, even relatively insignificant bad news, and overly enthusiastic. Because Mr. Market lets his enthusiasm or his fears run away with him. So as illustrated by those two images there. <laughs> and then, okay, so because of that, because of this disregard for fundamentals, the people believe that it was a new era of investing. As long as the trice, price was trending up, it was time to buy. The price was trending down, it was time to sell. So there was little regard for business fundamentals, and Graham and Dodd predicted that the results could not fail to be tragic, or I should say they reflected that the results could not fail to be tragic. And here's the headline from that infamous day in 1929. So the neglect of underlying business value and this and succumbing to the market hype was the, prim the primary culprit behind the, the market carnage unprecedented of 29 to 32. So now we have almost 80 years of data since the original publication of security analysis. And we can assess, there are various, various studies that can assess just how sound and how enduring are, are these principles. So first of all, there, there have been two bubbles that behave in very similarly to the, what was observed uh, by Graham in the late 20s. And that is the electronics bubble of the early 1960s and of course the internet bubble of the mid to late 90s. In both, the sort of old-fashioned considerations of earnings and capital position were shunned in favor of new era. Again, the same sort of hyperbole, new era. Uh, in this case, it was related to new technology. So the results could not fail to be tragic in these instances either. The early 1960s witnessed the expansion of commercial jet aviation and the advent of many new consumer electronics products. And this did create new industries and successful, profitable companies. But it was also an opportune time to float new IPOs, many of which were of a questionable quality. The writer Burton Mar Malkiel in his classic uh, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, several years after the Tronics boom, observed that it was called the Tronics boom because the stock offerings often included some garbled version of the word electronics in their title even if the companies had nothing to do with the electronics industry. Buyers of these issues didn't really care what the companies made, so long as it sounded electronic with a suggestion of the esoteric. And of course, this is applicable to many dot-com stocks as well. As long as it had a dot-com, it was, it was a hot stock. And Malkiel goes on to describe some of these dubious early 60s IPOs, such as the Boonton Electronic Corporation. So despite poor or even negative earnings, some of these companies rose as high as 70% in the first day of trading and would double again soon thereafter. And within a few, just like the law of gravity, within a few years, all of these poor quality but high priced Tronics companies, uh, highlighted by Malkiel, vanished along with a considerable sum of investor funds. So Graham was no longer an active participant in the market by that time, but many of his disciples were. And of course, it's telling that many of them steered clear of the electronics bubble as well as the technology bubble that would follow. So the dot-com bubble was very similar in that you had a, a new generation who believed that this was a new era where the old rules regarding capital position and earnings, none of those things applied anymore to this strange new world of the internet and online commerce. 
but of course, the value school has proven correct yet again. 2006, again, a couple of years after the, the, this particular bubble, uh, Harrison Hong wrote in the Journal of Finance, on February of 2000, this largely profitless sector of roughly 400 companies, and of course he's talking about the vast majority of the dot-com companies here, this largely profitless sector <laughs> commanded valuations that represented an astounding 20% of the publicly traded volume of the U.S. stock market. These and similar figures led many to believe that this set of stocks was in the midst of an asset price bubble. In turn, the valuations of these stocks began to collapse shortly thereafter, and by the end of the same year, they had lost nearly 70% of their value. So this is just a hypothetical, just an illustration. So we have ABC.com, and you can see that the intrinsic value is flatlining, and in some cases it was, it was descending uh, rapidly in terms of lack of earnings. And, but the market price is just getting, because of Mr. Market getting excited about this new technology, is just going through the roof. And this is, a, I think, a classic example. Former executive of a dot-com that specialized in furniture was asked why did his company go bankrupt after such a high stock price. We would get an order for a $200 end table and then spend $300 to ship it. We never could figure it out. So this is a classic bubble scenario. A huge ramp up in stock price and just a huge price inflation. And of course, eventually it, um, it burst. So these post-1920s new eras are dramatic, but they're periodic illustrations of the value, uh, value principles. So let's examine a more continuous state of data, long-term value versus growth. Of course, uh, value versus growth is not a day versus night dichotomy, and there are those who, who practice a sort of combined form of, of the styles. But for this study that was conducted by Ibbotson, the focus was Generally, value investors insist on that strong margin of safety, whereas growth investors are willing to forgo the margin of safety to a certain extent, and they're willing to pay higher prices relative to book value, cash flow, dividends, and so forth for more rapid earnings growth. As the great value investor Charles Brandis, who was tutored directly by Graham, wrote in 2004, growth stocks tend to be accompanied by expectations for future earnings that are far greater than the average shown in the past. Such stocks are often in exciting new industries about which there's a great deal of promise and optimism. So Ibbotson published a study in 2003. The value set was selected according to filters, to Graham and Dodd filters, and it employed a rigorous set of criteria separating by investment style as well as investment size, micro cap, small cap, mid cap, and large cap. And this is a, a logarithmic representation of the study. Year end 68 to year end 2002, we have an annual compound return of 11% for value and versus 8.8% for growth. That might not seem like a large difference, but of course over time it becomes a very significant difference. And one dollar invested in value in 68 would have become $34.63 by year end 2002 versus nearly half of that amount, $17.52 for growth. The lead author of the Ibbotson study, Michael Barad, observed that while it was somewhat expected that the value index would uh, outperform the growth index over a long time frame, a closer look at value and growth between the four size portfolios yields some interesting information. Over time, a consistent pattern of value outperforming growth emerges within each of the size groupings. So even the lead author of the study was surprised by how superior the value approach was. Another central element of Graham's approach is the importance of adequate dividend yields to long-term return. In the second edition of Security Analysis published in 1940, Graham and Dodd wrote that the common stock investor should ordinarily require both an adequate earning power and an adequate dividend. In 2011, the noted investor James O'Shaughnessy published a comparative study of all stocks, the general market, versus the top decile, top 10% of stocks according to dividend yield. This re he recalibrates it every year, and so I just want to put that, make that qualifier. So here, 
we have $10,000 invested in the uh, general market in 1927 becomes $38.5 million by uh, year-end 2009, whereas the same sum invested into the top decile of dividend yield uh, becomes $102 million, which is an improvement of uh, over 150%. So this certainly re reinforces Graham's contention in this regard. But O'Shaughnessy actually published in EVA a study that's even more germane to our discussion, and that is a general market versus the top decile according to value factor one. Now what he calls value factor one is a composite of price to book, price to earnings, price to sales, and price to cash flow, and highest EBITDA over enterprise value. The latter is a clearer metric than PE because PE can be distorted by debt. So this is a, a very sound composite that he put together reflecting several Graham and Dodd style filters. Uh, the time frame is a bit shorter because the data for some of these metrics was not available in 1927. So, so we see here that the $10,000 invested in value factor one, 1963, becomes almost $14.7 million versus $1.3 uh, for the general market, which is astounding. The average uh, compound return for value factor one is 17.18% versus 11.22% for the general market. So despite a time frame that's roughly half of that used for the dividend yield comparison, there's a much more dramatic discrepancy and that's not an accident. As Graham would have expected, a selection mechanism incorporating several of his criteria is more successful than one based around one alone, in the other case, dividends. The results of both studies covering data as recent as December 2009, so post-2008 crash, are strong confirmations of the timelessness of the Graham approach. And actually, interestingly, just a few days ago in the journal, they cited a, a study uh, that showed that value just this past year outperformed growth 19% uh, to 11%. And, uh, but I prefer these, these longer term studies because in any one year or five year time frame value can underperform but I think that the long term really tells a real story. So as Warren Buffett told a Columbia University audience in 1984, there will continue to be wide discrepancies between price and value in the marketplace and those who read their Graham and Dodd will continue to prosper. Another central element of Graham's legacy is his methodical scrutiny of financial statement data. He was the co-author of a book entitled The Interpretation of Financial Statements, and generally his, his reluctance to accept corporate financial reporting at face value, it, it sort of permeates, permeates all of his writings. And this was, a, this was a central aspect of his legacy, and in 1949 he wrote, the investor may well need some education in this area regarding uh, quarterly and annual uh, earnings reports. The more, seriously take, the more seriously investors take the per share earnings figures as published, the more necessary it is for them to be on their guard against accounting factors of one kind and another that may impair the true comparability of the numbers. And he wrote that in the first edition of The Intelligent Investor in, in 1949. And just a couple of months ago, in this past summer, professors Dishev, Graham, Harvey, and Raj Gopal uh, published a study entitled Earnings Quality Evidence from the Field. And this cre created quite a stir, generated quite a stir in the investor community. It stated that about 20% of firms currently manage earnings to misrepresent economic performance. The typical misrepresentation for such firms is about 10% of reporting, reported earnings per share. And one of the authors of the study, Professor John Graham, obviously no relation to, to Ben Graham, observed that 10% is a big number, considering that we often see companies missing earnings estimates by two cents a share or so. So clearly, Graham's cautionary approach to financial statement data is still very much applicable. However, there are, on some of the finer points, particularly regarding this matter of financial reporting, an argument can be made that not all of Graham's writings have held up 100%. When I asked the noted fund manager, Tom Russo, about what aspects of Graham's approach have not held up 100%, he stated that 
he stated the following. There are a whole series of additional expenses that don't necessarily appear on the balance sheet of a company these days. In Graham's time, you could look at the balance sheet and come up with a net asset number. That was a reassuring value that you could get, and if you had a big enough margin of error from that liquidation, then you'd have your margin of safety. Today, if you try to liquidate a company, there are a whole host of other expenses, like wrongful termination or environmental liabilities, that are not on the balance sheet, but that can affect what you'll get from the liquidation. Nonetheless, despite these anachronisms on some of the, the technical points, the core of the Graham and Dodd approach has held up remarkably well and has not only been vindicated by time but elevated by it. The extent of its durability and consistency continues to grow more apparent, not less apparent, with each passing year and decade. Now only a few elements of that supporting data regarding Graham's uh, legacy uh, I've been highlighted in this talk, there's much more supporting data that we haven't touched upon, uh, not least of which is the superlative performance of Graham's acolytes, and that happens to be the subject of Chapter 12 of the Einstein of Money. Here are just some of Graham's most famous direct disciples, people who learned actually direct, directly from Graham when, when back then. Of course, Warren Buffett, Bill Ruane, Charlie Munger, Walter Schloss, Irving Kahn, and Charles Brandis. Now, regarding the book, I want to take a few minutes just to explain why it's structured as a combined biography of Graham and a discussion of a modern application of his most uh, important investment principles. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to interview Warren Buffett for this project, and he stated that the margin of safety, Mr. Market, and another concept called investors as business owners, which actually interfaces with both in margin of safety and Mr. Market. He stated that those three concepts, quote, when they become part of your DNA when investing, you really can't go wrong, end quote. And that, those, there's a chapter devoted to each three, each, each of those in the book, as well as other aspects of his writing. Uh, he, Mr. Buffett also, <laughs> Mr. Buffett also noted how unconventional his personal life, his, his former professor, employer and friend's personal life was, and there's a, a chapter in the book entitled Stranger Than Fiction. And besides the fact that he had a fascinating personal life and, and uh, uh, financial career, he also had a really fascinating, rich intellectual life, uh, encompassing a, a wide array of non-investment interests and just an incredible scope of reading in multiple languages, multiple disciplines. He was a true uh, Renaissance man. Uh, and but from a financial perspective, as we learn about Graham's life, it's easier to understand what molded his unique approach to security selection and easier to internalize his principles. For example, his aversion to investment shortcuts was a reflection of his work ethic, and also it stemmed from a, a childhood that was distinguished by scholastic excellence. So he was not, he actually enjoyed digging deep into the numbers, digging deep into the data and getting that additional layer. He, he actually preferred not to take the, the shortcut. Uh, and in the long term, obviously, that, that stood him very well, it did very well for him. Also, his, his long-term view of the market was a reflection of his extensive reading on non-investment topics, history, philosophy, and even behavioral psychology. I was also fortunate to interview Charles Brandis for this project, who, who was also a direct disciple. And he told me that I think Graham's knowledge of history gave him the perspective of eternity and that's very important when investing. And it was a perspective that very few investors had uh, back then. As well, his insistence on a large margin of safety stemmed directly from his riches to rags childhood and his first experiences with market volatility, firsthand experiences with market volatility as a, an investment manager. And he experienced tremendous volatility and, and problems uh, going as far back as 1917. So he was actually, uh, from there he developed his, his margin of safety concept. So he actually was practicing a form of margin of safety going back well before the depression. But of course the depression did reinforce his financial conservatism and particularly gave him an aversion to using leverage. Anyway, there are many other examples in this regard all detailed in the book. And here are the table of contents. And just one example, just what we were just talking about, the first chapter talks about the, the, the riches to rags, how his family lost everything. Uh, 
And then the second chapter goes into discussing the margin of safety because it's clear that there's a link between that life experience and later how we develop that concept of the margin of safety. The idea that, you know, do not lose, focusing on not losing your principle as opposed to taking risks for that additional gain. Uh, 1980, the great investor John Train wrote that Graham ranks as the 20th century's and perhaps history's most important thinker on applied portfolio investment, taking it from an art based on impressions, inside information, and flair to a proto-science, an orderly discipline. Now here, uh, some uh, 33 years later, and all these studies later, I think an argument can be made that he's perhaps history's most important thinker of investment on investment finance. Uh, having worked on Wall Street for 42 years, Graham was able to observe certain patterns, and with, given his knowledge of human history and behavioral psychology, he, he was able to form a paradigm that applies remarkably well across different generations and different situations. So just a few months prior to his passing in 1976, he told an interviewer that, I think this business of greed the excessive hopes and fears and so on, and excessive hopes and fears, is, that's reflected in the Mr. Market concept we touched upon earlier, will be with us as long as there will be people. So implicitly, as long as these patterns persist, Graham's paradigm, the effectiveness of it, will persist as well. And I believe that the enduring strength of his investment paradigm, coupled with his innovative conception of a more stable basis of currency, his work as a macroeconomist, and that's also dis discussed in the book, is why he deserves to be remembered not only as a dean of Wall Street, but as the Einstein of money. And thank you very much. Uh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Two questions. Uh -huh. One of the criticisms has been that if one used this strict criteria for the overall market, one would have avoided much of the bull market of the post-World War II era. And another one with regard to his personal life, you go into his alleged womanizing. Okay, so regarding the first question, that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's an interesting point because his, the performance of his fund in the post-World War II era did in fact, uh, was actually slightly worse than the overall market for that particular period. However, that was also the period during which they took a 50 percent, his uh, company, Graham Newman, took a 50 percent stake in Geico, which later uh, paid them back about 200 times. So he, it was actually the time of his biggest, what it turned out to be his biggest ultimate su success in the long term. But that's correct that during that time frame, uh, it, did, it seemed like he was off base. And some of the, his younger, pe younger people that worked for him at that time thought he was too risk averse during that time. So that's, that's, that's a, a fair point. Uh, and then regarding your second question about his one, yeah, I mean, he was, um, he lived a very unconventional life, especially for that time. He was married three times, and towards the end of his life, he lived with a fourth woman who was not his wife. Uh, and he, he certainly, he, um, I think it's, it's sort of part and parcel of who he was. He was both in terms of investing and in terms of living his life, and also his intellectual life, like he was an agnostic, you know, at a time where that was un sort of uncommon. Um, I think he was just, he was someone who, for better or worse, would always do his own thing, and, uh, and it created a lot of controversy, but it also created a, 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 new, uh, a new way of looking at the market. Who else um, would you recommend could you invest with that's kind of a disciple of Graham and obviously Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, but who else is out there that... Uh... Uh, there's still a number of, I mean, there's uh, the First Eagle Fund that uh, Jean-Marie Eviard uh, uh, used to run. I think he's still an advisor to that fund. Uh, the, uh, Seth Klarman, um, is definitely in the book Royce Davis, you know, Royce Fund. Royce Yeah. Um, there's uh, I can't remember the name of Glenn Greenberg's fund. Uh, Charles Brandis 
still active. And uh, the Kahn brothers, they, they use sort of a modified Graham and Dodd approach. Uh, there's probably hundreds of funds around the world that, that adhere to this approach to varying degrees and in different ways. Uh, some are, are more purist uh, in their approach than others. So it's um, Li Lu, uh, L I L U. Um, I think it's called Himalaya Capital Partners. Um, and there's a number of others. There's actually there's a whole uh, chapter in the book that, that sort of lists out all of them. And many of them now are actually even in, in other countries. There's some in, in, in Europe, in Japan, uh, and some who focus on different uh, sizes, different sectors. So it sort of depends on your, on your preference. And, and then also, if I wanted to further my education in kind of his methods, are there any courses that you could recommend or other ways of uh, kind of enriching my knowledge? Yeah, well, I certainly would recommend reading Graham's uh, original works. Uh, I think Charles Brantz's book, Value Investing Today, is, is quite good. Uh, it's 2004, it's relatively recent. And uh, I really like Lawrence Cunningham's book a lot, and that's actually what got me interested in all of this. It's called uh, how, to, how, to, um, how to Think Like Benjamin Graham and Invest Like Warren Buffett. It's about 10 years old now. Uh, Pat Dorsey's stuff is pretty good. There's, I mean, there's, there's a whole world of, th those are some sort of off the top of my head, but, you know. Yeah. There were two bubbles you mentioned, the dot-com and the tronics. Did, obviously the dot-com came after Graham, but did, uh, did he have to say anything about the tronics bubble? Or it was, that was before my time though, as an investor, but, mm -hmm. Uh, in the dot-com bubble, there were some people that were making tremendous amounts of money. Oh, sure. Of course, if they... Most of but them they had, but that's, the whole, that, that's sort of a central aspect of Graham's thinking is that in the 20s too, late 20s, there were people who theoretically, if they got out just at the right time, they did very well, right? But Graham believed that it was a roulette wheel to, to try to time the market that way. He said, you're, you're right as often as you're wrong. So it's better to buy with a large margin of safety and then you have that cushion. So he, he, didn't, he didn't believe he could predict the price you know, two weeks from now or two months from now or anything like that. But he believed that if he bought with a significant margin of safety when the market was mispricing it so dramatically that it was just a matter of time before he could uh, take advantage of that. And of course, that's sort of the central aspect of how Buffett works as well. I mean, Harley Davidson had a bad earnings report in 2008. There was a, a financial crisis going on. The stock got hammered, and uh, I think the stock lost 30, 40 percent of its value. Um, no, actually, the stock lost over 60 percent of its value. It went from around 32 or something to around uh, 12. He bought it up at at 12, and then uh, a couple weeks later, it went down to eight. And people in the financial press were like, "Ah, oh, what a Buffett, such a fool!" It went down to eight, right? And a couple months later, because the fundamentals were still strong, and there was no reason to price it at 12. It went all the way back up to, <laughs> to 30. 30 or yeah, something, right? So he, he didn't predict that, that, he didn't know that 12 was gonna be the, the, the floor, but he knew that 12 was a ridiculous pricing for something where the intrinsic value was still at, in the 30s. So that's the principle, is that you don't, you, you don't pretend to know how to time the market, but you know how to take advantage of its irrational extremes. I always, I always wonder what's the good, I see the rule of thumb for buying margin safety, but I always wondered what the rule of thumb would be for selling once it's past its, 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 its uh, intrinsic value. Okay. Is there a certain multiple or factor, or you just wait for a head and shoulders or a technical analysis? Or yeah, I mean, what actually sets the flag to say, I'm done with this venture and I should move on? Right. So, I mean, there's, there's different opinions on that. Some people say if you're, if you're buying, with, you have to buy with at least a 30% margin of safety, and then once it, it, it goes back up and it corrects that 30%, then you sell, right? Although theoretically, if, if it's going back up because of irrational reasons, because of hype instead of you know, the, 
uh, despondency, it can go way back up. You're not going to take that chance. And there's others who uh, who prefer to hold for a very long time, just because they believe that it's it's the business is still growing and the earnings have more potential to expand. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many different opinions on that on that front. I'm sorry, did, did Grant have a firm opinion about that? Uh, I think it depended on the scenario. Sometimes he'd do what he called cigar butt investing. And this idea of cigar butt investing was it was actually a weak company. And you didn't really have long-term faith in the company. But it was being mispriced so badly that you bought it and just waited. It took a few last puffs of the cigar and then you would sell it once it, it like, it's so something where the intrinsic value, let's say it was $20 and it was, it was because of what's on the balance sheet, even though there was poor earnings. And let's say it was being sold for, you know, $7 or something. So you buy it and then once it got up to 15 or something, he'd sell it. Uh, whereas for, for companies that he saw, there was a, a strong companies, which is more of the style that Buffett does of sort of stronger long-term companies, then it was more of a buy and hold scenario. Um, <clears throat> Which, which edition of security analysis do you recommend people study? There's three of them, uh, right? There's, yeah, there's, there's uh, five. There might even be six now. Um, I, I mean, each of them draws on recent economic data, things like that. I mean, I've personally read the 1934 and 1961 editions, and I've skimmed through the most recent one. Um, I would kind of recommend reading the first one and then me, really reading the most recent one because I, I really enjoy his, his writing and it's interesting to see the original one. And, uh, but of course, you know, many things have changed since then, but some of the fundamentals are. But I would actually recommend reading The Intelligent Investor. If you haven't read The Intelligent Investor yet, I would recommend reading that before security analysis because it kind of, it's, a, it's a better kind of overview. Uh, security analysis kind of get, gets into the the trenches a little more. So it's sort of, uh, I think, an in, in, intelligent investor makes sense to read that before the security analysis. Yeah. You, you were saying that P, uh, price earnings ratio can be distorted by debt and there was a better indicator. Can you elaborate yeah. on that a little bit? So the PE could be very low because there's the company's carrying a lot of debt. All right, so you could have a very low PE, but not because, not necessarily because the, uh, the, the the price is underestimating the earnings, but because the price is being reflected of the huge debt carried by the company. So this other metric that uh, O'Shaughnessy talks about, EBITDA, so an enterprise value is basically the take, takeover value of a company. So it's what somebody would pay to buy the company. So they'd also have to take on the company's debt, right? They'd buy the market cap uh, capitalization. They'd also have to cover the debt of the company. So if you take that and you put earnings over that, that gives you a better uh, picture uh, and that, in, in, that takes account for the debt of the company, too. Yeah. What would you say were like the most important characteristics in, in his makeup, his DNA, that enabled him to uh, uh, be such a visionary in his field? Yeah. I think one is his independent, uh, independent thought, the fact that he was uh, willing to just, you know, everyone could be going in this direction. And he says, does the data point there? No? Okay, the data points here. I don't care if everyone else is going there. I'm going here. And that's, that's I think, a, a central aspect of his, his thinking is he was very independent. Uh, and he had emotional discipline in this regard. I mean, he, it's, uh, he was willing to, to go in and and uh, place a bet that uh, he knew might not pay off for, for quite a while. So he had uh, a patience and an emotional discipline that uh, I think was, was rare. And also he was just, he was comfortable both with the quantitative, he was a math major at, at Columbia. So he was very com comfortable with the quantitative aspect of this. And he was also comfortable with the, the qualitative dimensions of investing too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, the Einstein Nick of Money is on sale now. Don't forget to take a look at the first copy of the first edition of Security Analysis from 1934. Thank you very much.